It's the College Football Daily Fantasy Show from FantasyInsiders.com. Dan Strafford, Joe DeSalvo, and the arriving Ben Pritchett there. Uh, we are here with you to talk about this weekend's slate of college football games. A, a bit of a uh, programming announcement. Uh, moving forward, you'll be able to find Jordan Case on the GPP podcast every Friday morning. You'll hear him tomorrow morning about college football as well. So trying to cover all of our bases there and get you guys as much content as we can. Uh, Benjamin, Joe, how are you guys this week? Good. Thanks for having me Good. on again, guys. Look, I look forward to this every week. And uh, here we are, week three already. Week three, indeed. And Ben, are we starting to get into a part of the schedule where uh, we're getting some conference games, where we're getting into some known contests that are not so lopsided that it starts to change the way you research? Um, or are we still sort of in that early making of the schedule where we're plotting through and getting some FCS uh, competition and we're getting some mismatches that can be exploited as well? Yeah, Dan, it, we're definitely getting into more of a meaty part of the schedule, but it's still like instead of FBS versus FCS, it's more like FBS versus crappy FBS. And so that's kind of in some good matchups, some really solid, awesome football matchups. Um, like the LSU game, which is going to be great, and some other some other games that are going to be great actual football games, but not necessarily games you want to go out of your way to go crazy on for fantasy purposes. All right, we don't want to spend too much time on last week, but Joe, uh, I know uh, one of the big things the CFF site does is news and notes, uh, injuries, things that happened during the week. Uh, are there any things that really stood out to you over the course of the past week that – need to at least be known from a, a general college football standpoint. We're, we're setting our season long. We're looking at DFS. What news and notes really jumped out at you? I, I think the one thing for me, you talk about injuries, whether you play season format or you play daily, the, the, the injuries are really, really taking a toll. I know, you know, whether or not Western Kentucky has shown up on slates, the loss of Leon Allen, uh, big running back Aaron Jones out at UTEP. I mean, there's just a bunch of big names that are dropping. And I think, Moving forward, it'll be interesting to see what goes on with Vernon Adams. You know, we hear that he has a broken finger on his hand. And, you know, I don't – at this point, I don't know what giving a guy one week off is going to do. I don't know if a broken finger can heal. That might be something that he just has to play with. Maybe he gets off this week just because of the opponent. But I think he's the biggie this week moving forward And as far as what we're going to what we're gonna see. Are we going to – if Morgan gets ahead in some of these games where they're playing some of their conference foes, uh, are we going to see Vernon Adams play a full 60 minutes? And I think that bears watching. And, and Ben, how does that factor into your research when it comes to injuries? Are you now looking at both quarterbacks in the Oregon game? Are you staying away from it because it's a major question mark? How does that factor into everything you do? Yeah, I'm definitely staying away from it until I know more. But I actually am – Probably at this point, I'm going to have a Jeff Lockie GPP team just because I really feel confident that Vernon Adams isn't going to. He might he might suit up, but there's no way that guy is playing. If he's saying if he's calling himself questionable, that means he's not playing because normally a player's like, yeah, man, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to be there, I'm going to suit up, and then they don't then they don't play. That was like Corey Clement. They did that with Corey Clement with Wisconsin. I'm going to play, I'm going to play. No, he's not playing. He's not going to be out there. And that, and we might not know anything until an hour, two hours before, hopefully. Might not know anything until the game actually starts. But either way, it's Georgia State. They're not going to risk Vernon Adams because he's the guy. And Lockie could have just a huge game against Georgia State. So that's, that's one of those sneaky, sneaky plays if you stay on top of it could be, really work out. It's amazing. We've talked about it before about college football, too. The injury news, Joe, is really hard to come by a lot of the time. You, you get the uh, designation of the upper or lower body injury, you know, really descriptive, gives you a lot of detail about what might be going on. But even further, yeah. these are college students and you're dealing with different laws than you would be with NFL players and when it's their job. How do you go about researching? Well, I, obviously, we go to the CFF site. To, to find out this information, but what are you, are you just on top of beat writers and, and on top of what's going on in the world? Yeah, you have to stay on top of the beat writers. I mean, some of the major websites will have some of that news for you, but you got to be a big name player for you to really get really big news. A Vernon Adams news will break pretty much everywhere. But, you know, some of these guys, you know, Rashard Higgins over at Colorado State, who well, last year finished as a top fantasy receiver. It's hard to get news right now on what's going on with his ankle. You know, you got Daniel Lasco over there at Cal right now. Big game at uh, Texas this week with a hip condition. 
it looks like he's questionable. You got LaShawn Daniels now looks like doubtful over there at Iowa. You know, we said this last week, and I'll say it again. You know, college right now, your player pool is so plentiful that if there's a question mark, you're better off playing it safe, looking elsewhere, than settling for a goose egg when your guy winds up getting scratched at the last minute because these college coaches, they play coy. They, they're trying to hide the game plans. It's not like NFL where they have to, you know, they're forced to, to show their hand. And so it's a little bit of a poker game. And unfortunately, we're the ones that have to, uh, we have to read through that. And it's tough sometimes. Ben, you already mentioned the Oregon playing the GPPs. That has to factor in a little bit, right? Where you're taking some of these injury risks and maybe finding the second or third guy on the depth chart who maybe can factor in if you get some late breaking news, you're prepared ahead of time. I mean, injuries go such a, a long way to opening up value in daily fantasy. I mean, you saw that last week with Clement going down. Both of his backup running backs had massive games, over 100 yards, multiple touchdowns um, for uh, – well, I don't know if Deal got 100 yards, but he got multiple touchdowns, and Adumawe had – a touchdown in over 100 yards. So, I mean, like, lots of points came out of that backfield, and the only reason they got playing time was because Clement was out. And so we're still we're still going to be looking at those kind of uh, matchups every single week. Like, that's the number one thing I look at is who's injured. For this week, I mean, you have Keon Hatcher's out. So that's going to open up some Arkansas targets. So who's the guy that's going to step up there? JoJo Robinson, you know, one of these other dudes. I mean, they're, JoJo Robinson's a men price guy. He's not even on the FanDuel slate. Don't even get me started on that. But uh, he's on DraftKings for 3K. And when you know right now, it's almost impossible to find a, a decent 3K option on DraftKings. So that it's, it's very important to stay on top of it. That's why, like, if anybody is listening to this and they, they need a good source, I, I know Joe stays on it the best he can. He's at the CFF site. Um, he, he puts out a lot of those little blurbs as he's getting them. Um, Roto World does a really good job. Uh, some other... Twitter follows are pretty good about finding stuff, but overall you got to do a lot of the homework yourself. Absolutely makes a ton of sense. And a, a lot of what we uh, try to do here at fantasy insiders is give you the information when we have it. And if not, then help you find it when we can't, but uh, certainly stay tuned to this show every Thursday. Uh, we are posting it to YouTube and iTunes as well. So you can take it with you. Who doesn't want to take Ben with them on their morning commute? I mean, come on. That sounds like a lot of fun. Um, but uh, ben, any they don't get my face. <laughs> they don't hey, get my face. Mobile devices are a whole new world, uh, Ben. You get get your face on the train. You can broadcast it via Chromecast onto a TV. You're ready to go. Um, okay. Ben, any <laughs> any performances last week that stood out to you? You already touched on, on a couple, but um, anybody uh, either exceed value or really lay an egg uh, who you were looking to perform? Well, I mean, I... <laughs> It was an interesting day of action because, like, we had three slates, which is weird. Um, never really ran into that last year. I mean, they had the all-day slate, um, and then they had the early and the late. You have to go all the way back to draft street days to run into where they had a top 25 slate. But, like, the, the mid-slate was so awesome for me. Um, I made all my profit and covered some of the little losses I had on the early and late and just had an awesome mid-slate. So, uh, yeah, that was great. I, it, Davis had a good mid slate too, so I'm guessing that the write up did really well right in that little area if people were on it. And so that was like, that was like Nick Wilson, Brieda. Um, I had seven touchdowns for my running backs. I mean, I was in good shape to start. Um, but like, yeah, it, it, those were really impressive performances. Um, Bowling Green is, is, is legit. They're prolific. Matt Johnson is taken up right where he left off. I wrote down a couple of the other notes. Uh, oh yeah. Rutgers has a bunch of knuckleheads. I put that with stars and exclamation points you can, behind you can see it. see the Empire State Building, uh, over my shoulder <laughs> lit up in, in scarlet there, but, uh, I can't argue with you. I mean, uh, Learn how to cheat if you're gonna cheat. Like, do it right. Don't don't meet in incognito in Princeton. Like, uh, anyway, and don't don't um, body slam women outside the um stadium. Allegedly, allegedly, all allegedly. But apparently, there will be video at some point. Is what I've learned. So <laughs> that usually leads to no longer being allegedly. But yes, as of right now, alleged proceedings outside the stadium. Um, certainly not fun times in Piscataway, New Jersey. But do not use crew, guys. He's out. Yes, that <laughs> because he body slammed the lady, allegedly. In, in uh, so you could allegedly use him. You just can't actually use him. So the, there you go. Exactly. Have it. Um, 
Rutgers does have a matchup with Penn State. Uh, do we do we see some Hackenberg this week? Do we do we get uh, a secondary that's depleted and a coach that is suspended and a team that is walking into a happy valley of 108,000 people? Is is it is that a as as the kids say is that a thing this week, Ben? Uh, it's a thing for me. You'll have to ask Joe. Um, but I think for like as cheap as Hackenberg is, and it, as much as I hate him. And like, I literally hate him. I'm going to have a Hackenberg team. I am because I have to have one and I'll hate myself if I don't. Right. Um, but will I have like my, him as my cash game quarterback? Hell no. I'm not going to have him as my cash game quarterback, but I'm going to throw him in a $25 GPP and see what happens. I mean, especially with De- with Deshaun Hamilton or, or Godwin or just some, some kind of combo and see what happens. I mean, he could have four or five touchdowns like he had in the bowl game. I mean, he's not incapable of having huge games. I'll, I'll tell you, if we're going to stick with that game right there, there's a guy that came in last week. We had him as a freshman to watch, Saquon Barkley, okay? Penn State was only up 10-7. Came into the game. Don't be surprised to see Barkley get a lot of work. I, th- this could be a game where, where I mean, look, he ran over 100 yards in the second half alone last week. We could see him take over the lead role from Akeel Lynch pretty darn soon. We will uh, touch more on uh, games throughout the the spreecast here. As I said, it'll hit iTunes and YouTube as well. Uh, If we could, Ben, looking at the early slate first uh, to break down these two early and late slates on on FanDuel and DraftKings. Any stark differences between the two slates, between DraftKings and FanDuel? Any games that we need to be aware of as we line up construct uh, that aren't on both sites? Yeah, Bowling Green, uh, the Bowling Green Memphis game, which is the highest total of all the games on the whole day, is on the DraftKings slate. It's not on the FanDuel slate, so you're you're gonna have to have another different strategy for each site. And DraftKings has tightened their prices pretty considerably from where they opened, and FanDuel is loose in their prices, so they've gone in almost opposite directions. And uh, I don't really like it, but I do play a lot on FanDuel, probably a little bit more than I do on DraftKings, so. It helps me there because I actually like a softer a softer cap because it makes people make good decisions. And when you can roster a lot of different options, you you have to make the best decisions. So yeah, that's the game that's on um, on DraftKings. There's a FanDuel game. I can't remember which one it is that's only on FanDuel and not on DraftKings, but it's it's not a huge win either. So as you break down these games, and Joe, thinking of uh, the news from college football that comes up a lot, or, or sorry, the numbers better than news, is, is these gigantic over-unders, the, the 75s and the 79s. And when you're constructing your lists each week and, and trying to find breakout performances and trying to find guys who are, we'll talk about your start sits later in the, in the show, do number do the over unders and and the the spreads really inform what you guys are doing at the CFF site? Yeah, a- absolutely. We've always looked at some of the Vegas totals. I mean, I you know the one thing you can't control is weather, but you do look at some of those over unders because that's going to be your best bets to find some of these wide receipts, wide receiver threes. You know, maybe a tight end here or there. Uh, your running back two or three. Your flexes because. You know, look, take, for instance, Ole Miss, Alabama, right? Some of these real defensive games, you're not going to get a lot out of those games. You're going to look deep, as Ben said, it's at, at these Memphis Bowling Green games. I mean, look, it's just a fantasy gold mine waiting to happen because, you know, not only are you going to go with Matt Johnson, you got Travis Green, the running back there. You've got Roger Lewis at the, at the receiver, but you could go Garrick Dieter. Uh, I mean, there's such, there's so many options from a Bowling Green standpoint. You got Ronnie Moore. And the list goes on and on. Moe's F- Frazier from Memphis. You, I mean, Paxton Lynch. You could almost make a team right there if you could afford it from that one game. Ben, take me through. What are we looking at for this first slate? Uh, what are some of your top plays uh, at each position? As always, remember, uh, Ben's article is available over on fantasyinsiders.com. Uh, that is where you're going to get the the meat and the potatoes of, of the slate. That is for sure. What we're trying to do here is uh, give you a preview of what that article has and, and give you an idea of where you can start your lineup construction. Uh, certainly uh, over on FI, though, you can get uh, a, I'll use the word dense, and I don't mean that in a negative way, a a long read from Ben each week on, on the early and late slates. And, and it is in-depth and it is informative, and it certainly uh, has helped me construct some lineups the past couple of weeks and last season, of course, 
Uh, so Ben, if you, if you could take us through some of your top plays and Joe, uh, either as he hits on somebody you really like or dislike, feel free to chime in, but uh, I'll come back to you as well uh, for your, your thoughts yep. on this early slate. Yeah. First of all, everybody just kind of uh, bear with me on those long write-ups because they're, they are long and you, I'm never going to win an award for my grammar. I'm from Tennessee. So <laughs> even though I'm college educated <laughs> and did really well on, on English and things like that, and went on an academic scholarship, whatever. But like, you know, I, I'm not sitting there with a, a fine tooth comb going through everything and trying to make it right. That's what we have total for. Uh, but the game I missed that you were just talking about, you were talking about one that was on FanDuel that's not on DraftKings. It's Cincinnati um, versus Miami of Ohio. And that's actually a very crucial game for FanDuel because the Cincinnati options are great. And uh, you were asking for top plays at the position for that mid-tier range. I have Gunner Kill listed for uh, the expensive range. I have Matt Johnson. Those are very site-specific quarterback plays. So um, if you'll notice on the article, the cover boy is Nate Sudfeld. And the reason why I chose him was because he's actually useful on both sites. And he gets a matchup against Western Kentucky, which is really nice. It's always fun uh, watching all of the guys at FI really choose who their cover boy is and, and go through the, uh, the, the consternation around whether or not it's a safe pick or if they're, they're maybe pushing the envelope a little bit. So uh, I know Ben had some questions this week on who he was going with. So I think... The, this, the, the slate, uh, sorry, slate agnostic pick makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I went safer, and I wanted to go with somebody that, like, you know, maybe was not the obvious guy, but also very, very safe. I, I, and you notice, like, everybody does that. If you just click on Twitter and anybody who's writing an article for any slate is going to pick the safer ones. But me, in my in my soul, in my heart, if I knew I wasn't going to force you to pick him by putting him as a cover boy, then I would have uh, a lot crazier selections for sure. And at the end of this show, I'm going to ask Ben, and he may not answer. I, I, I've run this by him, but I, w I want a, a, a hot take of the week. And I, I know at FI, it's analytics, it is, it is numbers, it, but I need to know who, who the gut there knows uh, from Ben. So we'll, we'll get to that later. He may say no. He may just not answer. It's, stay tuned. That's why we're here. Uh, Joe, for yourself on this yeah, early slay, I know Ben touched on a, a few different guys there. Uh, does anyone else stand out to you as a top play? Uh, uh, on this you know, there, thing, there's, yes. yeah, there, there's, there's a couple of like, when you look at Western Kentucky playing Indiana, I do like Brandon Dottie, oh, the quarterback for Western Kentucky. I, I just do. You had Leon Allen go down to injury. I do think DeAndre Furby is going to gonna step in and do okay there. But he's going to chunk the ball around. I think Jared Dangerfield now is a little closer to us labeling him as healthy. So you've got some weapons there. Um, and one of my favorite guys, I tell you what, coming up now, look, week one, guys, I was a big fan of Ray Laurie. He just blew up. Last week, I was a fan of Aaron Jones. And for two quarters over at UTEP, looked like he was going to run for about a thousand yards against Texas Tech. Um, I'm starting to jump on the Jihad Thomas bandwagon over there at Temple. And they have a sweet matchup with UMass this week. And uh, there's a couple of good plays in there between TJ Sharp, the receiver, and Jahad Thomas, the running back at Temple. That's a guy that I really, really like moving forward. Hey, Ben, what's the, what's the process here for, for tight ends? Obviously, the difference between the two different sites. Um, are you seeing movement on where uh, players are offered or listed as positional players? Are you seeing changes in how we're, we're approaching the two different sites because of the, the roster construction differences? Yeah, I think um, we're instantly seeing people that are winning GPPs using tight ends. I mean, you saw that even in NFL, but in college, uh, I think Davis in his GPP, he had Jarrell Adams as just a filler because you're looking for that guy at that 3K price range as a wide receiver. And DraftKings is intent on using the good tight ends that are getting significant tar uh, targets like Higby, like um, Hunter Henry, who, who's gotten a huge pop price increase this week. But like guys that get a lot of targets in their offenses that are, you know, a lot cheaper than they should be based on the targets and the catches and the yards and things like that. Whereas like on FanDuel, you're restricted to use them as tight ends. On DraftKings, you're now really considering them as – punt wide receivers and I've actually thought about listing their DraftKings salaries as part of the write-up when I'm doing the tight ends I just haven't yet just because I, I don't want to try to push them as that just because I use some guys that are, could put up zeros as right. tight end options on on FanDuel and I, I would never do that on DraftKings you, you don't want that in between of listing the price being uh, perceived as a good play at the position absolutely and uh 
there i'm sure a disclaimer or two that that could be thrown up there but certainly makes a ton of sense and um as we sort of churn through this season it'll be interesting to see how those prices change on DraftKings and whether or not they adjust uh as they move forward to uh the tight end position producing and producing at a higher level and being parts of these gpp lineups and do they change you know do they make that adjustment on the fly or or is it something we see the the whole season Joe, over to, over to you. You guys have both touched yep. on a couple of guys in this early slate. But from your perspective, Joe, are there teams that you're targeting? Guys, uh, quarterback, wide receiver combos or, or running back, wide receiver, quarterback combos that you think are, are team specific that maybe a DFS player uh, could target in these larger tournaments to try to differentiate themselves? Yeah, I, I think absolutely. We go. We already talked about Memphis Bowling Green, right? I mean, between Paxton Lynch and Mose Frazier, you've got Roger Lewis receiver at Bowling Green with with Matt Johnson. I think that game alone, right there, you've got you've got two options. I mean, you've got Brandon Doughty over there at Western Kentucky, and like you mentioned, that you know you could maybe a couple in the the tight end there with Higby. Um, so you've got a few teams with options. You know, the one thing, and I'll, I'll come back to this um, as a you know aside from just uh, attaching the hitch with a receiver and a quarterback. There's a real interesting option out there for me this week, and that's that Duke game hosting Northwestern because you got Thomas Sirk, who looks like he's the real deal from a fantasy perspective. You know, we we fielded a lot of questions this week on putting Sirk so high playing Northwestern, but I think right now there's just a lot of questions going on on what do we know at this point and what don't we know because I hate to play six degrees of separation with college but you know we could also look at northwestern beat stanford but stanford hasn't exactly looked sharp either i mean they were only beating central florida 10 nothing at halftime um you know that central florida team lost to florida international who was beaten by two touchdowns by indiana um who barely beat southern illinois so i mean look we could go on and on but i think the fact that northwestern stepping away from home for the first time goes to duke i'm really impressed with cirque I still like him as a high-end fantasy quarterback this week, even though he seems to be playing a, a tougher defense with Northwestern. I am a, as, as a Rutgers fan, I'm a, a huge fan of the transitive property. It's how it got me through college because the one or two <laughs> wins on the schedule, you could, Hey, you, we would have been national champs. Come on. It, it all makes sense. Um, there you go. Then as we transition towards this late slate, um, you mentioned earlier about the, the strange middle slate last week. Do you see these slates as being even in distribution of games, or are you seeing one being a, a more enticing slate between the two? Last week, you were very, very specific about saying that that middle slate seemed to be where you could find a lot of headway. And I know Jordan also was very into that middle slate because there were some of those smaller teams involved that you needed to do a little bit more research and be a little bit more involved in the industry. Of these two, as we transition to the night slate, are you seeing even distribution or, or do you prefer one over the other? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, uh, that's a good question. It's a, it's an interesting combo because like on the early slate, it seems like there's a lot of 70 plus or 70 ish totals on games. So like a lot of high scoring games, which I think actually works against you when there's so many, because you have to really nail the right picks and nail the right players within those games. Um, when there's just one, you can kind of, whittle down the the right options and and kind of kill it the right way um and i think the late slate is more of that i don't know how to say it that 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 one you want to target the one that comes together easier yeah. now i've just begun writing that up and i've just begun starting putting these uh rankings together and things but like from what i can tell there's like a lot of these cheaper running backs that flow really well and that have like amazing matchups for their prices and uh, I know Joe is eyeing one that he was talking about before we came on air of who he really wants to talk about. And I agree with that guy. I think there's a lot of more expensive running backs that are really good too. But the, this mid-level of running backs is going to let you open up to spend more on a quarterback, which is going to make a really good team. We'll hit on uh, some start and sits uh, from Joe towards uh, the end of the show where I think we'll, we'll lead into that uh, – culmination if we will um uh, with one final play but uh, if you guys have questions don't hesitate to ask in the chat uh or certainly uh in the question area below um ben has been doing also a member chat over on fantasy insiders uh, on saturday mornings at times uh, those will be announced if you are interested uh to certainly get in on that as well but i think that um 
Ben, if we could just look at this late slate, uh, what your top plays are, who you're targeting. Uh, Did we lose him? I think we lost him. Okay. I, I'm okay. I can. I, I, yeah. Dan, I can take you over from there. You, 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 you set me it? up, right. man. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. Right. I have no idea what you just asked, but I heard the words "late" and "who do you like." So we're gonna go with that. Um, I, I think, um, I think Brian Hill for Wyoming is an is an all encompassing type running back, and I think he has a amazing matchup right here against Washington State. I think that there's there's like um, Washington State's offense is prolific and they're going to score and they're going to do well in their own right, but I think Wyoming has enough with Brian Hill that he can get the receive, the receptions that he's known for and the big yardage numbers. He's just been massive. If you look over his career, he's had games where he single-handedly won weeks for people because he's had just such huge performances. He's super cheap. And then, of course, I'm not going to take his guy because he just wanted – I know he wants to talk about him so much, so I'm not going to say it, but his name rhymes with Bareem Munt. And that guy is coming back off of a suspension and he's going to be raring to go. And so I won't talk about him, but he's a really good play. Um, I think that's where you kind of have to start. Even though I love Chubb, I, I love Booker and I love Collins. I think those matchups are sick, but it's just not necessarily the best for lineup construction. And, and if you want to do one, that's fine, but you're going to have to go cheaper to quarterback and possibly even punt it. Ben, before uh, Joe, before we get to you, Ben, a follow up there. Do you find a position – I know in baseball we typically look at shortstop, catcher for, for where we're going to punt. That's where we lean because we can find the lower price guys and we, we can move in that direction. Are there – is it wide receiver? Is it running back? Do you find a, a place where you're going to go cheaper more often or is this really just slate specific and, and how the, the salaries break down? It, it is slate specific, but it's also like you don't want to just invest all your money into a running back. Uh, unless the matchup is just ridiculous like Ray Lowry's was first week. I mean, we knew Eastern Michigan was terrible against the run. He, even though he was the most expensive running back, he was like a must play because their defense was so bad against the run. This week it's Jahad Thomas. Like he mentioned, he's only 7,700 on FanDuel on the early slate. Um, this slate on that late slate, you've got guys like Chubb, who's really, really expensive against South Carolina. South Carolina has given up two straight 100 yard rushers, but to, push Chubb into your lineup as like three and 4,000 more than Kareem Hunt and Brian Hill, you're really taking on a lot of risk and you're having to downgrade into those 3K wide receivers or super cheap quarterbacks that just don't have the upside. Uh, I mean, you're going to be basically Hackenberg. You're going to have to have Chubb on your Hackenberg team, which is not saying it's a bad move. It's just very volatile. And, and if, if South Carolina shows up like they tend to do against Georgia, you could have a, have a rough go. Joe, uh, to you, uh, I, we'll, we'll get to your start yeah. sit uh, in, in a bit, and we can uh, touch on the, the, the rhyme game that Ben has put before us. But um, <laughs> if, if you could, um, who do you like in this late slate? Or is there a specific game you would target above others? Uh, and uh, are there some maybe diamonds in the rough that, that you can share with us uh, who uh, aren't part of, of your start sit in a little bit? Well, I think the first place you have to look if you want to go heavy quarterback is Travon Boykin over there at TCU. I mean, if you want to slam dunk from a quarterback spot, that's probably it. And the good thing there is, is you got Matt Davis over there at SMU. Um, I think SMU can put up a few points on, on TCU. And if you're a Travon Boykin fan, that's what you want. You want him on the field as long as you possibly can. What's interesting about this slate to me is that there are a couple of teams on here I'm not particularly sold on right now. And I'm not sold on Stanford right now, and I'm not sold on Arkansas, particularly after what Toledo did to them. And Texas Tech, look, Texas Tech looked really sharp last week. So I don't even think Pat Mahomes is a bad play right now, even against Arkansas. And, and these are for some of the seasonal guys as well. I, I don't think that's really a bad play. Um, for DFS, you might be a little bit more of a risk right there. And I think the guys like Travon Boykin and Luke Falk are an absolute slam dunk. If you're going quarterback, and you want to load up with two guys, put the bank on them right now. The only thing that I will warn some some uh, players out there is that the only thing that we really haven't seen from Washington State this year is we just haven't gotten that game yet where three receivers catch 
150 yards or two guys go for like 170 and three times. It hasn't happened yet, and right now it looks like Gabe Marks is by far the number one option with Dom Williams a slight. Maybe Dom Williams and Craycraft as 2A and 2B. So if you're putting a stock in that Washington State receiver, it's got to come from Gabe Marks. That would be a nice combo for you right there from a receiver quarterback standpoint in that game. So, Ben, as we take this all into consideration and we are trying to build two different lineups here. We're, we're building a cash game. We're building a, a, a tournament lineup. Do you find kind of piggybacking on the question before, do you find a position that you punt at more often? Do you find a floor and ceiling question easier to answer for a specific position? Do you, do you feel like the running back position is e easier to understand a floor of a player and, and a ceiling or, or again, is this just sort of that each team, each uh conference each game is different yeah i mean there's obviously established floors with your running backs you kind of have to hit it i mean you can't you can't have a clunker from a running back assuming he's not owned by like 80 percent of the people but like if he's if he's in a 20 percent rate or something like that you can't have a guy go out like basically like alex collins did against toledo and only get a touchdown and 30 something yards rushing now, they, they came out after the fact that he was hurt or sick or something and didn't practice much during the week. Again, that goes back to the hidden stuff of college football where they don't tell us that stuff. So if you ran out an Alex Collins lineup, even if you had the other pieces around him working, uh, he was just so expensive that it hurts you to the point where you really you really messed up and it, and it wasn't going to work out for you. But like with wide receivers, the floor is, is much lower, I guess. I mean, you can have a guy, as long as he catches a touchdown – if he's a cheap play, which is normally I'll have one or two, maybe even three wide receivers that are pretty cheap. Um, if he gets a touchdown, then I'm I'm pretty happy most of the time. I mean, it, it, unless you unless you, if you're pairing a quarterback with your wide receiver, you kind of need to at least have one wide receiver go off. I guess is what I, I should say. So uh, as we uh, draw to a close of of the the uh, spreecast, as I said, it'll be available on iTunes and available over. Uh, on YouTube as well. Uh, to mention again, you can find Ben's write up over on fantasyinsiders.com. If you're not yet a member and you're watching and you're listening, fantasyinsiders.com slash plans. Uh, we'll give you all the information you need. Uh, and as uh, we talked about in the first show, actually make that the second show. Uh, great to be partnering up with uh, the CFF site uh, with Joe, the, the voice of the CFF site, and certainly all the information they're bringing to the table. Uh, so you're getting a, a lot of information uh, in one place for one price. Uh, so certainly worth checking out. Uh, I am not one to shill often, but Ben's write-ups are in-depth and accurate and, and are worth the read for the, the grammatical uh, escapades at times. So uh, there are, you may see some people screenshot them from time to time because there is uh, some great stuff. Um, I think more and more there's some good writers uh, coming on board as well. You have Sammy Reed, who's had some some hot takes as well that have been uh, well-received on, on Twitter. So uh, good stuff all around. But if you aren't a member yet, certainly uh, is advisable. So Joe, you're going to take us home. We're going to ask Ben one more question before we log off for tonight. Of uh, I'm, I want to know who his, his top gut hot take is, and we'll get to that after uh, this. But Joe, you over on the CFF site do a, a start sit, right, where, where you're going through uh, players and you're siding. Uh, whether it's start them or, or sit them. One, let's explain to those who are watching, those who are listening, what, how you believe this is valuable, what, what you're trying to offer to your subscribers and to the people reading your site. And if you could take us through uh, here in week three, uh, what names you have in front of you. Yeah, I mean, look, what we try to do with the start bench, guys, is we try to take out the obvious, right? Everyone can start. Everyone knows the top 10, top 20 at each position. But what we try to do is we try to go in depth. Some of, some of those guys that are that are sitting there on the border for some of these teams, you know, maybe possible running back two, wide receiver three, flex option, QB two. Those are the guys that we try to look at. We try to take in, into account the seasonal player and also the daily player as well. So that's where we go with some of these start benches. Um, and that's and that's really how we make the list. We try to stay away from the obvious and try to give you guys uh, a decision on some of these players where we get the most emails, we anticipate the most emails, responses on questions of, hey, Joe, should we or shouldn't we with this guy? 
So week three, uh, we are now uh, three weeks deep in the college football season. What do you got? Who, who, who are you focusing on? And, and uh, actually, when you post this, when on the site? This went up yesterday. Actually, we go up with start sit on Wednesday. So uh, this went up yesterday. But what, what's interesting is that because we do a full FBS slate, sometimes, uh, you know, a, for the DFS player, we either hit a few of them or we don't. I think we have a, a good handful this week. So we're going to go ahead and run down those guys for you. So we're going to go ahead and start with the bench. And there's four names that we're going to throw out. You know, we really do like Ole Miss this week. If there's one thing that Ole Miss has looked up until this point, it's sharp. Alabama hasn't looked sharp at all. But our rule of thumb, guys, is that when you have a running back going up against the Alabama defense, we're not going to chance it, not only in seasonal but in daily as well. Jalen Walton, we think you have to leave on the bench this year. He is capable of taking one to the house every time he touches. We just don't necessarily think it's worth the risk in Tuscaloosa this weekend. You've got Jonathan Gray. Ben, you talked about him last week. I mean, what a disappointment he's been. 57 yards on 17 carries this week. It doesn't even look like he's the guy anymore over there. So I think right now he's a guy you stay away from. They're playing Cal this weekend. Jonathan Gray, week three bench. Then you've got Jeremy Johnson at Auburn. What the heck is going on over there, Gus Malzahn? I mean, look, at this particular point, maybe it's Peyton Barber up the middle, Rock Thomas right. I think at this point, you just tell, I just think you tell Jeremy Johnson to unload a deep ball. You stay away from every intermediate route possible. You go three yards in a cloud of dust. We know what that looks like. Barber versus Fournette. That's what we're looking at this weekend. Stay away from intermediate routes. Jeremy Johnson is a bench. Five interceptions, three touchdowns on the year. And the other bench that we have is a little bit of a surprise because Drew Hare has thrown for over 350 yards in both games this year. But they're stepping up in competition. They're getting Ohio State. I don't know if Kenny Galladay is going to find some separation from that Ohio State secondary. He could. He could give you a big play. I don't necessarily think it's worth the risk. I think if there's a week that you're going to take a back seat with Drew Hare, this is probably the week. Okay, so that'll take care of the benches right there. We're going to go over to the start, guys, and we're going to go right to that Auburn LSU game. We mentioned Peyton Barber. I think if there's one takeaway that I had from that game last week, it may have been the Rock Thomas fumble. It may have been the third down conversion to completion. Peyton Barber just looks like a Gus Malzahn running back. He's just tough. It looks like he's the guy. If I'm Auburn, I'm leaning on that guy. I could see him getting 20, 25, even almost 30 carries right there in that game, going over 100 yards, maybe getting the one or two touchdowns that Auburn needs to stay in that game. I think Peyton Barber is a start at a running back two or a flex position. There's two teams that I think are really interesting to play court running back combos this week because, Ben, you mentioned it earlier, Wisconsin, right? Corey Clemens out. So you got Dare Ogunbowale, and I hope I nailed that this time, but you got him and Taiwan Deal. I think that's a great combination. You know, one thing happened last week that's really rare with Wisconsin. They threw for four touchdowns. That doesn't happen every week for Wisconsin. I could see them rushing for four or five touchdowns this week. If that happens, you possibly could get a touch a touchdown or two each from both of those running backs. Maybe they both go over the century mark. They've got Troy as a sweet matchup. I think you roll with them. And then you look at another running back combo in the Big Ten, staying with that theme. Madre London, LJ Scott, Michigan State. They've got Connor Cook, one of the best quarterbacks in the nation. But right now, they're getting those two young guys to work. And they're getting them to work, and they're going to start getting into Big Ten play. Right now, I don't know who the better option is. They both look solid. But with a matchup against Air Force right now, who's missing their starting quarterback, I can see Michigan State just running the ball down Air Force's throat. I actually think Madre London and LJ Scott are both good starts. Now, when you look at some quarterbacks now, you've got Dane Evans at Tulsa playing Oklahoma, Matt Davis, SMU playing Texas Tech. These are more chance plays now, but they're playing in high prolific offenses. What's really interesting is that Tulsa has run the ball an ungodly amount of times this year. I see them playing from behind more so in this game. I can see Dane Evans airing the ball out, racking up some yards for you, putting some points on the board. And I can see Matt Davis doing the same thing with SMU and getting some rushing yards for you as well. Two touchdowns, 250, maybe throw in 70, 80 yards rushing with a touchdown. That warrants a quarterback two start, guys. So there you go. And then also, let's go to Notre Dame. We got Deshaun Kaiser, right? 
last week, pulls out the game at Virginia. If that did anything, it helped his confidence going into this week. And let's be honest, guys, right now he's got one of the best wide receivers he's throwing to in the nation in Will Fuller. And I think when you got a receiver like that and you got an arm like Kaiser has, I think he's a start this week at a quarterback, too, for some people that are playing in some deep leagues or maybe anybody that wants to take a shot out there with him. And then another guy that I like, we touched on the Western Kentucky game. They lost Leon Allen for the season. DeAndre Furby, the red shirt freshman, steps in for Leon Allen. They're playing Indiana. Indiana has given up an average of 35 points per game. They're going to be looking to key on the Western Kentucky passing game. A lot of people haven't heard of DeAndre Furby yet. You will, hopefully, after this weekend. I think he's a must-start over there at Western Kentucky. And then we'll draw it in with the close. Right here, guys, You, a lot of folks have asked us. Kareem Hunt, Toledo. Joe, you got him at number one running back in your draft guide, and yet the guy is suspended for two games. We get it, guys, but we don't win leagues in the first two weeks of the season. We win leagues at the end of the year, and all this guy does is turn out the yards. You want to know why we have him number one? Guys, he's got 11 consecutive 100-yard games. He's gone over 100 in 15 of his last 16 games, and in those 16 games, he scored 22 touchdowns. He's gone over 190 yards rushing in three of his last six and over 140 in eight of his last 14. They had to get a rebuilt offensive line, but guys, Toledo went into Arkansas last week and handed them. So if they can handle Arkansas, they can handle the MAC. Toledo, Kareem Hunt, he's back. Week three, I'm fired up, guys. I don't even want to stop now, but I know I got to pass the baton. So there's the week three start bench, guys. Kareem Hunt, welcome back. Certainly, welcome back. I, I wish uh, this was a little bit more produced to have some welcome back <laughs> Cotter music ready to to cue right now for for Mr. Hunt and. <laughs> And certainly uh, a man named Furby will be very uh, intriguing to, to track as well. Ben, I don't know if you can match intensity here. Joe just brought the nuts there to, to uh, the, the close of the show. Uh, and certainly a lot self. of great names there. Uh, certainly a lot of great names there and names that may not be on everybody's radar uh, heading into the weekend. But uh, the question I do want to add, one, now, are there any names from what Joe just went over that are intriguing to you that you hadn't thought of previously? I'm sure you've, you've sort of uncovered a, a good deal of them as well. But uh, anybody uh, name-wise there that you want to touch on uh, that you want to either double down on what Joe said or, or maybe interject on, on the other side? Well, um, note to self, don't talk to uh, Joe about his start bench because, my Lord, that was like – it was great, enthusiastic, and unbelievably well done research. I mean, me and Dan just had to sit back and go, oh, holy crap, man. He is just going to keep rolling on this. But, you know, you did a great job. You brought up a lot of really good names. Um, I like your style. Uh, there, there's uh, Kaiser is a really good punt play for, for daily fantasy purposes just because of the offense, the style. Um, he does stand really big in the pocket. He's like 6'4". I watched some, some of his high school tape. And he looked really good. Furby is like 240 pounds. He's from right down the road from me. He went to Innsworth, which is like a rich a rich boy school that got started as a uh, – there's an all-boys school here in Nashville called Montgomery Bell Academy. And uh, the Friss, if you've ever heard of them, he was a senator, speaker of this uh, elite. I don't know what he was, but he was one of the top senators. And uh, he he started Innsworth, and they they put out some really good football players. Um, but yeah, he's a big boy. I think Anthony Davis, that who is is going to be his backup or may actually compete with carries, is is played for Indiana and is going to be playing for. Uh, for them as as for Western as a graduate transfer, so that's going to be a really interesting dynamic to see what happens with him and how many carries they give him um, in that in that scenario. But I mean, other than that, there were just a lot of really good dudes that he that he mentioned. Um, some are more yearly type plays than necessarily daily, but all yeah. all good options. I, I you know I, I'll throw out a couple of more names for you if you don't mind. Uh, I, I do no, no, think no, no, with the loss of Ke- no, no. With, with the with the loss of Keon Hatcher over there at Arkansas, I really like Jared Cornelius this week as a big play out of Arkansas against Texas Tech. I think that game could have a few more points than what we think, guys. I'd take a shot on that guy. And remember, remember the name Edo Smith at Southern Mississippi. That it's booked. It's all booked. It's it's uh, here for posterity. It'll be on iTunes. It'll be on YouTube. It'll be on Screencast. <laughs> It is, it is noted, Joe. We have it in the books. Uh, ben, to you, 
You write that one down. Is it? Um, no, I know who he. I, I, he's not on the slate. I, well, who does he? Who does no. Southern Miss play? Are they playing uh, this uh, week? Yeah, they play at Texas State, but they're not on the slate. But I love this guy. I, I really think. Okay. Uh, keep an eye on him. Future slates. Future slates. Edo. Um, Edo. Hashtag future slates. Uh, ben, to you for, for your final take here. Uh, is there a a play that you like that maybe isn't? Um, one that would be done by uh, analytics and by numbers and by matchup per se, but just somebody that for whatever reason, while doing your research, you kept coming back to. Not going to hold you this one. This is more for fun for guys that that you see and guys that sort of keep piquing your interest for one reason or another. Did you just not say that this is the hot take and just kind of kind of beat around the bush? This is the hot take segment. I walked all the way around without actually saying it. Yeah, I'm okay with the phrase "hot take" because I think if you're if you are what we are as a tout, and you aren't doing the research and you don't have opinions, if you just go straight off the of stats in Vegas, then you're really gonna have a hard time being successful. I think a lot of the notoriety that I have gained is because I have taken some chances on hot takes, like D'Angelo Brewer riding him out again last week, and he had 20. 20 something carries and over 100 yards and touchdown. I mean, just those those takes you kind of have to live and die by sometimes. I mean, I've also died by D'Angelo Yancey two years ago, and now he's starting to come on, and I get a lot of flag by the fact that he's coming back and being actually <laughs> decent now. Um, but Elijah Hood is a guy I really, 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 really like. He is 5,400 on DraftKings on the early slate. He's facing Illinois. Um, Illinois hasn't really been tested so far this year, but last year they gave up 239 yards per game on the ground and all, and like five yards per carry. They were one of the worst teams against the run. Early in the season, they were giving up 200 plus yards to like every back they were facing. And so, um, if North Carolina is smart, and sometimes I, I, I try to act like coaches are smarter and more strategic than they should be, um, or than they are, and uh, Elijah Hood, if he gets the carries, he's been phenomenal this year. He got two touchdowns in the last game. Didn't get a single goal line carry um, with North Carolina in the first week against South Carolina, which was the most ridiculous thing. And, and they actually caught a lot of flack about that because he had 13 carries for 140 yards rushing. But he didn't get any goal line carries, and he's 220 pounds and like 6'1", 6'2". It's not like he's a little back. So um, assuming he gets a heavier workload, touches the ball 20 times, Facing an Illinois defense that people don't know is bad and that is going to be bad against the run, I actually think that he, playing at home, could be just like a super dynamite play and actually works really well in lineup construction because he's so cheap on DraftKings. On FanDuel, he's only 700 cheaper than Jahad Thomas and Devion Smith, and though both those players have equally good matchups and probably are a little bit safer based on just the flow of everything Although I don't know if you can call Devion Smith safe, but UNLV is just as bad as Illinois, if not worse, against the run. Joe DeSalvo at the CFF site on Twitter, the voice of the CFF site, and uh, Ben Pritchett at Natural Slugger. As I said a couple of times, you can find Ben's right up over there on FantasyInsiders.com. If you're not yet a member, uh, FantasyInsiders.com slash plans. Find Jordan Case tomorrow morning on the GPP Breakfast of Champions, our podcast. It's available on iTunes. This will be available on iTunes and on YouTube as well. And join us back here every Thursday night at 11 p.m. as Joe and Ben join me to talk college football. My hot take is that Rutgers wins in Happy Valley 23-17. to 17. Bring it. Bank it. Bank it, Ben. 23-17. 23? With that. Yeah, 20. Bring it. Who's scoring the points? Andre Patton. Lock him up. <laughs> Lock him up. With that said, we wish you the best of luck on the Saturday slate, and we'll talk to you again next week. Have a good one, guys. All right.